British Grand Prix of 1984, the decision to build a one and a half litre turbocharged Formula One engine was agreed between Ford and the specialist engineering company Cosworth. Keith Duckworth, designer of the successful old Cosworth DFV, soon faced a desperately compressed schedule after his first attempt with this four-cylinder engine failed. From now on, everything would hinge on this, the sophisticated engine management computer. Last week's program ended as the technicians struggled to start the new six-cylinder engine, their first faltering step on the long road to perfect a fully competitive turbo. That's pretty rich. I see it's a sustain current in the injector. Yeah, here it comes. The engine is running, just. A faltering misfire at 4,000 revolutions a minute means something is wrong. That's taking 12 volt battery to zero. Momentarily. The whole battery. Oh. Inside the test cell with the engine, Paul Ray and electronics expert Steve Taylor watch the fuel pulse signal jam open as the engine's ignition flattens the battery. It seems as though it's pulling the battery right down. Yeah, because the contacts are going open up there. If you wire it direct, you won't have the same thing as the battery. Like a season jumping out, it's still missing a few. Yeah, I can yeah, feel it from just sitting yeah. here and feeling the ground. Yeah. Okay. You know what we forgot to do? It might be... There we go. Okay, now that it's was dead. Steve. Was it? The engine is shut off. It's time to make some changes. Yeah, I can tell that. It's fuel. I can feel it. Let's put the suppressor line in. I think we'll be okay. There's a bit of spark scatter, and the other spark is missing, but... But that could just be the engine running so rough yeah, that we're actually... Right. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah for Taylor there's simply relief that his rewiring of the engine management computer actually works because it means that the um, that ignition modification to the spark output has cleaned up the back feeding noise to, to spark that was stable on there I could watch it from up there well I say stable it was continuous the spark drops off and the fuel keeps going no no Plenty of spark, it's fuel. Spark stays on, it's fuel. Oh, the spark stays on, fuel stops on. We're not into a fuel loop at all, are we, Jim? No, Haven't no, got no. Uh, nothing to affect fueling at all. No. Okay. You don't need it. Um, he did make a calibration change so that everything in this looks at the left side. By left side and right side, they mean the left or the right bank of cylinders in the V6 engine. And it is. It's behaving pretty much the yeah. way you'd expect it to. We got good right to left. We're missing the same number of times on the right as we are on the left, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the temperatures are even. Temperatures are yeah. very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. So, well, I think we're close. You know, I think if we back step one more time, we're going to yeah. be just about where we want yeah, to start ours today. 40 minutes later. That feels a lot better. Yeah. Just the engine is running at 7,000 revolutions a minute. To make it run more economically, they must now reduce the fuel pulse width. Engine noise and soundproofing reduce instructions to a series of hand signals. Good. Looks very good. Yeah. Looks, you can feel it, you know, everything yeah. is. Formula One is really a fuel formula. Each year, the cars must become more economical as the permitted fuel load is reduced. The trick will be to make the engine the most powerful and yet the most economical ever designed. Stay well. It's quivering. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of false triggering coming in. Okay, I see what's happening there. We're going to change. So that's the true trigger. That's right. What we're doing is we're falling in and out of phase, but not by very many crank degrees. No. So you can't really feel it out here. But if we had the stacks open, you could see some fluff coming out. Let's see where we're at. A little bit more. Fluff is smoke caused by too much fuel. The computer is still picking up rogue signals triggering the fuel injector at the wrong moment. Taylor searches in vain for the rogue signal. We 
just had a little one come through. I don't know if you felt it. There it goes yeah. again. We're fall I bet you, well, we're getting one big one come through, and we're coming out of sync for two revs, and yeah. then we go back into sync. That's why we feel that. Okay, it's time almost to put on the new cam sensor then. Gee, we get to try everything today. I'm to tag it up. Yes, let's do something. something. As soon as I see somebody look at me, I'll tell them. The engine is okay. shut down. What are you running to? Oh, seven. Seven. We had good temperature. We had an occasional miss, one of them which took out the whole system and brought it down to cold. And then we recovered and brought back the yeah, whole I mean system. The, the yeah, fuel. it was fuel. Our safety, our safety barrier on fuel was working well. When it sees the problem, it's shutting fuel off so we don't have a run, which is pretty good. But it's fuel economy conscious, all right? <laughs> but at the wrong time, yeah, I'm right sure Alan Jones will appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's time to change the cam sensor uh, finger so we can maybe get a little of that noise out of it, if there is any there? Noise is jargon for the unwanted electromagnetic pulses. Yeah, we're still seeing noise, and we're, we're, the, the strategy is obviously going into some high region, and the fuel shutoff that you can put in for protection is uh, yeah. it gets catching that. It's actually noise. catching it. It really is shutting it off like yeah. it's supposed to. So the strategy is working okay. We just uh, <laughs> the, the good news problem. is the engine runs, but the bad news is not all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's steady on the You're only looking at one injector, right? An hour later, the reason for the erratic fuel injector pulse is still a mystery. If we could look at all six, and you said that, I, I would walk away from it. Point taken, yeah. You it know, could be happening on one of the events. We always talked it. about doing that. We said, what if we didn't have a nice, quiet spot to sample plenum pressure? What would yeah. be the result? And the answer was, the computer would Bounce come around. through, it would pick off a high spot on the wave, run a calculation and send out, then it would come into the valley, pick another one and send out another totally different pulse and continue to iterate that way, it can do that. Perhaps not surprisingly, they find that all the wires are acting like radio aerials, picking up pulses from the engine's ignition system. That's the identification link. We don't know that. But it doesn't go anywhere, Steve. But it's not connected to anything. It's just an open wire. Yeah, follow up the tab there. After two hours of rewiring, the V6, triggered by its computer, sounds like a racer for the first time. The fuel pulse is steady at last. Fuel mixture is made fractionally leaner, and they decide to take the engine up to 10,000 revolutions a minute. For good measure, Steve Taylor moves the sensor to another fuel injector to check all six are receiving clean signals from the computer. Steve Taylor gets the signal. 10,000 revolutions. They have an engine that runs. Perhaps this, at last, is the end of the beginning. Yeah, I like that. Ten days later, software expert Jim Coates has returned to the States. OK, let's ask Jim if uh, he's uh, received my changes. Steve Taylor and Bob Stelmazak in Northampton communicate with him daily by computer. OK. Hey, 
Jim's still not awake yet. Okay. Do you want to read one of your mail messages? I certainly would. I'd like to read all of them, and I'm going to get a hard copy of them if I can. The engine management computer, or module, was designed to be strapped on top of the engine. But because of the rogue signals, they've decided to redesign it for another position on the car. The modules are being uh, fabricated in the States and sent back over here once they're checked. And, ah. ah. Right. In fact, Jim Coates, who's now responding, he's phoning us on the VAX, has sent us a message here at 2.54 in the morning, and if we got him up at 5.30, he didn't have okay. much sleep last night again. Now, what, Jim is, is phoning us, and we're going to try to answer him if we can. Time 6.22 over in the States at the moment. Jim's just getting up, had breakfast, <laughs> fed the kids, and uh, is, in, is getting into work. I don't think he's been to bed personally. He better not have. I'd be disappointed otherwise. It depends on his typing speed. If it's slow, we'll know he's been working all night. He's pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> we might have got him before coffee. Let's see if he understood why we made the changes. Um, and, and, and ask him when he reviews them to evaluate the effect on speed, the printing speed of the display. Okay, so look at them this morning. With a six hour time difference, work on problems can continue long after the British engineers have finished Very for the nice. day. Yes, okay, good. Even so, there's always an element of competition between the two groups. I wonder if you thought of that initially. I don't think so. Because the engine management computer is to be moved, a complete wiring change will be necessary. I just told him the status here now is that Cosworth have issued a wiring change that will be carried out with the hardware, and this will be carried through while this particular requirement for module reverse mountings is maintained. Um, as long as he knows the status that we're at in the UK, then his bench setup will mirror the image of the dynamometer and fixings here. Hopefully, so that if we get any problems, he should see them in the US. Doesn't always work, mind you, but <laughs> we try and get as close to the real thing as we can. We have to keep both sides of the water informed so that if he's making any changes on his benches or if he gets a particular problem, he has to be to the same standard we're at in, in the UK. Um, otherwise, we're both chasing different problems, and he may be chasing a problem that's a day old and we've already resolved. The program for the engine management microprocessor is top secret. It must read, evaluate, and act upon constantly varying information several hundred times between each stroke of each of the six pistons. But as the project to develop an advanced engine management program reaches its climax, the danger of this transatlantic data being hijacked grows. It may be of interest to someone who would be developing electronics for Formula One engines. There's only a few of us, you know. Um, as far as the ability to break into it, um, if a user who is not authorized to get on the system attempts to break into the computer and if he knows part of the information he needs and he attempts to just try it over and over until he comes up with the proper combination, the computer will recognize his attempt to break in and in the software, in the computer, it's instructed to take evasive action so that even if he does find the correct combination, it will not let him in until a certain time has passed where the computer has judged he has probably gone away, and the true user can come back in. So I think the access privileges are quite secure. February the 21st, 1986. It's 9.15 in the morning and six degrees below freezing at the Boreham Proving Ground in Essex.
the car was completed the night before, and both drivers are here. Patrick Tombo. Duckworth congratulates Jeff Goddard. Wiring changes are still incomplete, so the finned aluminium computer remains on top of the engine. Obscured by the complex turbo machinery, the size of the small engine seems to surprise even Duckworth. It just sits in the shadow, the, <laughs> the, the, the small engine sits in the shadow of the car. Um, but uh, I don't know, the intercoolers and everything else don't look quite so uh, big and out and in the way, do they? Somehow. I suppose it's looking down on it is better than looking at the thing and all that. But the turbos and the radiators, known as plumbing, have been the responsibility of the car's designers. Oh, well, all the plumbing uh, look, looks, yeah, looks, looks, looks very nice, doesn't it, actually, with that? And the, from having put the centre intake in here, getting that into there, and just about sneaking this thing round the corner. No, I, I notice that the depth of the is it's the it's, wrong way around, isn't it? It, right. should, it should be deep and thin in that direction instead of being wide and far. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we allowed them that one because I did the pressure <laughs> drops and it was okay. Or if it's the body like that, if we go the other way, it doesn't fit the body. <laughs> I didn't realise those things are going to be sticking out there like... Alan Jones will be the first to drive a car so new that even the team are unfamiliar with the controls. Hey, Kiwi. Kiwi. Yes? Which way's on on the steering wheel? It's smart. There are five straps on the safety harness, two over the shoulder, two on the hips, and one round the crutch. It must be fitted by the engineer that can be released with one punch on a centre catch to escape in case of fire. Like his overalls, the balaclava is fireproof for a few valuable seconds and could save his life. Alan, the oil pressure's meant to be about 60, somewhere in that cord, all right? OK. Right. And what's it... Uh running temperature if it's below a certain thing uh, i really want to be above 80. Yeah, so it if it doesn't have to come in yeah, more tape on it On goes the carbon fiber body shell. Two years of work and millions of dollars are now in the hands of one man. The road's well left off, but even later on you need to be above 80 before we give it any stick. Yeah. I just asked uh, Dick, he said about above 80 and uh, oil pressure 60. Unlike Jones, Patrick Tombe has driven for Ferrari and has learned to judge a turbo by its sound. 
Sounds good. For a few moments, everyone forgets the cold. It's real Formula One at last. Don't turn it off from there. It's running about uh, 78 or so. That's oil That's pressure. About 85. Even with the radiators blanked off, the engine has only just reached its operating temperature in the icy conditions. Steering wheel position is good. Pedal position is good, except for the accelerator and brake. And I'd like the gear stick to be a bit further away, as much as you could. Um, but this feels a lot better. You know, more support. Yeah. <coughs> Engine run cleanly? Yeah, no yeah, very clean. Clean as a whistle. There's no, there's no sort of popping and banging, it just runs really clean. As ex-Williams designer Neil Oatley keeps a careful note, Tombe asks if there's any lag in the throttle response. Yeah, it feels, it feels really good, you know, very good response. No, no popping or banging or... Synchronized with one another, huh? The engine. Synchronization, synchronization between the, the throttle and the engine. So far, yeah, I'm not going all that quick, but it feels good. The engine management module is only slightly warmer than Jones. Dick, you haven't made any provisions for a heater, have you? <laughs> not quite yet, no. God, I think it's cold in there, isn't it? Is <laughs> that oh. <laughs> for me? Yeah. Oh, I, thought it, that's, I thought it might have been for the engine. <laughs> Despite Jones's good humour, this old airfield is icy and dangerous. By 10.30, conditions have not improved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The smooth power that Jones has experienced is due to a totally uncompetitive turbo setting of 2.5 bar, about half race boost. But at least everything else is stable. No problem. 78 uh, pounds per square inch on the oil, yeah. and uh, about 86, 87 on the uh, temperature. Fine. Um, but no, nothing, not enough. Nothing. You used time five that time? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Charlie. Engine clean all the way up? Yeah, there. clean, no problems. Very clean on the down run and no hesitating or popping or doesn't seem to be any of that nonsense going on. And the initial... Oh, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you'll, you'll start to improve it now. Yeah, I'm going to get some probes with those. Should be those two. Jim Coates is not happy with the plenum charge temperature or PCT sensor from the computer and decides to change to the left-hand bank of cylinders. The two ground should be T and U. And U? Okay. Let's try U then. There it is. That's that ground. So what should be the uh, PCT for that one? Okay, that's L. That's PCTL, so what, where's right. the signal? So we should be up on N. So N. And so if we go into that one. So the other one anyway, it's there, isn't it? And it's, yeah. The other one is... But the real problem is that the engine was never designed to run under Arctic conditions. Depends when they're running, really, because it won't take us half an hour to do. Are we going to have this engine back? I wouldn't have thought so after today. I thought so it worth 
Do you want to get some miles? Well, I want to get some miles on it. Because at the moment, I mean, they've got no references on this circuit, how quick no. they go in and what it feels like or anything. He just says it's long, it's bumpy. You know, it runs. Mm -hmm. Now it's Tombe's turn. He will put in half a dozen trouble free laps and confirm Jones's view that the engine is smooth but well down on power. Three laps, I think. Mm -hmm. we'll stop That's what he said, and then lunch. Lunch? Yeah, I've been drinking more than lunch. Yeah. 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 For the moment, his main concern is the rather uncomfortable crutch strap on the ill fitting harness. Oh! Yo! Oh. Do you think you need to get the, the crouch uh, strap uh, from so far back? Since the first icy test at Borum, the team have given the car an inconclusive run at Snetterton. Now, aerodynamicist Ross Braun is back in the Cranfield Aeronautics wind tunnel. All Formula One aerodynamicists are locked in an endless quest for more downforce. Downforce is aerodynamic pressure on the car. It produces extra grip. Before sliding skirts were banned in 1980, this grip was achieved with undercar suction or ground effect. There still is a type of uh, performance from under the car, but nothing like as good as the ground effect cars used to be. But we, we're now back into the area of the same overall downforce of the car um, that we had with the ground effect cars, but it's much more draggy, it's much less efficient. So we've lost efficiency, which has been compensated for with the performance of the engines. So um, the cars are really probably back in, well, they're, they're faster than the ground effect cars again. In terms of overall downforce, the rear wing probably contributes 50 to 60 percent of the forces involved whereas in ground effect days it was a much smaller percentage now the cleaner and higher quality the flow of the rear wing we can get the more performance we get out of it with this new engine it's very low very compact so the engine is no longer the limiting factor to how uh, clean we can make the flow to the rear wing <laughs> Britain is still in the grip of a miserable winter. This is the Castle Donington circuit. The other Formula One teams bake in the Rio sunshine in preparation for the first Grand Prix of the season. Cosworth have produced an engine with full race boost and the vicious power induces wheel spin on the wet surface. It is mid-afternoon, but all day things have not gone well. The loop's not open, obviously. The day started with bad news from Rio. Progress made by the other teams in electronics had been seen first-hand by Tombe. I said that the electronics presented by Honda and by BMW makes them look like uh, they're just uh, beginners. They're just unreal type of uh, software and hardware that they come up with. It's clear the electronics advantage that Ford had hoped to achieve before racing the car has been eroded. But the engine management module is now working well, and it's simply a lack of circuit testing that's holding up the development of the software strategy. The team trailer is a mobile workshop. Inside, Steve Taylor and Chief Development Engineer Martin Walters pass the latest strategy or map from the main computer to the electronically programmable memory, or EEPROM. Hello. About three minutes. This is known as burning a chip. 
Each chip can produce quite different behavior from the same engine. Well, obviously the mapping data is different. It's, uh, this has got the most latest specification in the, uh, in the chip for the, uh, for the engine calibration. Okay. Right. It is ten past ten, and with rain forecast, there's no time to lose. The EEPROM carrier is clipped into the module. Before the team can allow the car out, they must check the engine kill switch on the steering wheel. This is a safety device to stop the engine if the throttle jams. It fails to work. Immediately, the team assume that it's a fault of the program in the engine management computer. Yeah, I know, precisely. I don't know the thing, which is still bad. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that, so we ought to sort it. Yeah. Paul has got, I think, the, the program that was run at Snippeton. Yes. We can't run the car like that because it hasn't got a field map in for the for the yes, But at least we can see if the killer switch works on that. Yes, okay. Because presumably it did work as net. Did work. Yeah, no, it worked. I mean, yeah, no one said it didn't. Well, it worked so at the shop because I mean we tried. We checked. Yeah. Did it work at the shop yesterday then? Harry, did that work yesterday at the shop? But does anybody really know? It did or it didn't. That worked yesterday. Yeah. I think the first thing is what Paul's doing is to put that one in, which is the one that was run at Snetterton. Yeah. Okay. See if that works. If that doesn't work, then we have to have a look at the wiring. There's only three wires from, from that plug to there and back, so there's very little that can go wrong. They decide to change the module. But Steve Taylor is convinced that the program is correct and starts the painstaking search for a fault in the car's wiring. Because the engine is set for race boost, they cannot use the module from the slow run at Snetterton. The only engine management module available is this one from the previous dynamometer test. But because there's no need for a kill switch on the dynamometer, no one knows whether this module is correctly wired or not. No, it's oh, sorry, we just want to try it. We just, oh, yeah. We're not even going to bother. Hang on, there's one of these. Yeah, three yeah. shots. Uh, and he says there's an old patch of ice up against the pit wall on this side, but oh, yeah. just go very slowly. still doesn't work, and team manager Tyler Alexander turns his attention to the switch itself. Yes, I don't want to do that unless yeah, you can reach that, but can you? Not very well. Not very well, but you can reach it, yes, okay. The rain, forecast for midday, arrives half an hour early and brings with it Team Lotus, hoping to test their latest Renault engine. 
Taylor has decided to put the module back the way it was. The activity attracts Renault engineers from the Lotus team. Okay, we'll just check to see if it runs and then we'll go. Unaware of the increasingly desperate kill switch problem, the Renault engineers try to catch a glimpse of the new Ford engine. Shortly after midday, the fault is finally traced to a wiring change in the car. As cold fingers fumble with the catches, everyone knows it's going to be a cold, wet afternoon. fumes at the Dino Ferrari circuit in Italy. It is the end of untimed practice at the San Marino Grand Prix. Now the teams prepare their cars for timed practice to qualify for a position on the starting grid. During the morning they have run in race trim, but to qualify the cars are changed in subtle ways. This is the waste gate. It's a spring-loaded valve which controls the boost from this, the turbocharger compressor. For qualifying, the boost must be increased, so waste gates with stronger springs will be fitted. It is the first race for the new car. The engine management computer is now half its original size and finally mounted in its correct position on top of the fuel tank. Take a look at all of our sensors here and make sure that everything is working properly. For the race, the computer must run the engine as economically as possible, conserving every drop of its 195 litres of fuel. To qualify, a turn of the screwdriver reprograms the engine into a fire-breathing gas guzzler. I'm not sure whether it's all together quicker or not. Actually, the atmosphere should be a bit quicker. I think you're going to be all right in the race. Oh. You know, well, that's only on full tanks. It's yeah, nice. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. No problems. 
As timed practice starts, favourites for pole position are the Honda-powered Williams. World champion Prost in the Porsche-powered McLaren. Both the Williams cars look for a clear run, followed by the Renault-powered Ligier. With a flying lap of 1 minute 25.8 seconds, Nelson Piquet's Honda Williams lays claim to pole position. But his main rival, Ayrton Senna, in the Renault-powered Lotus, goes ahead by less than half a second, almost immediately. took Piquet just nine laps and his first set of sticky qualifying tyres are finished. Each team is allowed two sets of qualifying tyres and to prevent cheating, an official marks them with a code. Qualifiers are made from a special compound that goes sticky when it gets hot. If we can get them nice and warm, we can sort of go out and get into it on the first lap, or certainly at the end of the first lap. Yeah, and then if, if, if you get it into the first lap, would you, would you get a second one out of it? No, that's it. That's it, because it's a quite a long lap there, and they're gone. So you really, I mean, in terms of qualifying laps, you get two qualifying laps this afternoon and that's it. Put it away. Which is a bit crazy, really. The car is ready for its debut. Formula One includes a set of dimensions to which every car must conform. But before it can be measured, the flat spots must be rolled out of the tyres. Tombe will not drive the new car in this race. His is still being finished back at the Heathrow factory. While other teams grapple for a position on the grid, Japanese technicians in the Williams pit quietly prepare extra engines in case the others explode. These Honda V6s are said to produce up to 1,200 horsepower for qualifying. But today, all eyes are on this new act as it enters the Formula One arena for the first time. The diminutive V6 can now run in anger, its onboard computer holding left and right hand banks of cylinders in fiery equilibrium. Jones, feeling grip in his tires, tries for a quick lap. Qualifying tyres on the rear of the car tend to warm up quicker than the front, so the team have developed a system for preheating the front tyres before leaving the pits. But technologists from Goodyear are concerned about the effect this might have on the compound. I want to try and get back out if I can and have another go. The reason I went for it on the first lap is because the front tyres actually felt quite good. They were hanging in there. So it's pointless doing another lap, that's where I went for it. Well, we're close there, it's coming out of the Is he happy with the pickup now? Is he happy with it? Is he never happy with it? Probably never. I'll ask him this. Another set of tyres are being gently cooked. How are those tyres doing? They should be. Another couple could of minutes. Could do with another four minutes. As the qualifying hour ticks away, a problem is discovered. 
The left-hand rear brake caliper is rubbing on the wheel rim. electric blankets, the front tyres are readied for another quick lap. Despite pleas from Jones for an extra powerful qualifying engine, Cosworth have refused to build one, believing instead that a track record of reliability will pay off in the long run. Jones cannot better his first attempt, and as other teams improve their performance, slips to 21 on the grid. The smoke pouring from these cars during qualifying is evidence of the massive amount of fuel being burned in the search for extra speed. With special tyres, excessive boost, even special engines, qualifying has become a farce, with little relevance to the race itself, where economy and tyre durability are needed to win. Despite being egged on by their hometown Tifosi, even Ferrari seem wearied by the irrelevance of it all. The new team begin to get into the swing of it. Little more fuel is added as Mike Cranifus gives Jones his latest lap time of 1 minute 30.8 seconds. Despite his lack of horsepower, Jones, determined to have another go, decides to cobble together a set of tyres from his used qualifiers in the hope of knocking a few tenths of a second off his lap time. What are they doing? Just trying to make a decent sort of tyres out of the two that I've used. Yeah, just, I mean, two, two tenths in your eights or nines, yeah, no. it's, it's, it's very close to it. At the other end of the pit lane, Nelson Piquet has used up his qualifiers and watches his Williams teammate Nigel Mansell try to push Lotus off pole position. <laughs> Jones decides to put race tyres on the rear of the car and qualifiers on the front. But Cosworth's poor race spots a problem. 
the exhaust has cracked just ahead of the turbocharger. Today's game is over. Jones will drive 29 competitive laps in tomorrow's race before retiring with a damaged radiator. But for today, unnoticed by the assembled press, Jim Coates secretly files the first day's work into the computer. Sixteenth, number 24, Alessandro Nanini with the Minardi Motori Moderni. Seventeenth, number 15, Alan Jones, making first public appearance for the new Haas Lola Ford THL2 with the new six-cylinder Ford Turbo with a full team from the electronic engineering division of Ford here with it as well as the Cosworth people running conservative boost in qualifying but running very reliably, two cars alternating all day.